Okay, I guess we're starting early. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rasmus. Um, I'm sorry about my lack of French. It's really bad. My son speaks French, so in a couple of years you can invite him and he can give a, a talk. Um, the slides for today's talk are online at this URL. My Twitter ID if you want to complain or contact me at some point. So first a little slideshow of where PHP is being used out there. So I was at Yahoo for seven years and all of Yahoo is written in PHP on the front end anyway. Yahoo is big in Asia, so all the Chinese versions of Yahoo. And it has also leaked into most other Asian internet companies. All the big Asian companies are using PHP. So Baidu and Taobao, Alibaba, um, Weibo, Sina, all these guys. QQ. Um, a lot of the big photo sites, so Flickr, SmugMug, PhotoBucket, are all using PHP as well. Discussion sites, like Dig and blog sites. WordPress, obviously, is in PHP, and there's a lot of big blogs hosted on WordPress.com. Media sites, obviously Wikipedia is written in PHP. Most forum software that you end up using will be PHP. Zynga, on the, the server side of Zynga, Facebook, obviously. Uh, WePay, former company I used to work for. My current company, Etsy. Lots of government sites. Um, and then a few other interesting sites. So, quick question for you guys. Do you know who this is? Arthur C. Clarke, very good. You probably cheated. Were you there last night? Oh, okay, yeah. He cheated. I gave a, a similar talk last night uh, at the university. Yeah, this is Arthur C. Clarke in Sri Lanka. Um, I was pretty amazed at being able to teach PHP to Arthur C. Clarke. Um, but even more amazing is a project in Sri Lanka called Sahana. And Sahana is a emergency relief or a disaster relief management tool that I find really, really cool. I've been doing PHP for 17 years now. And sometimes it's a little hard to stay motivated, especially in the last five years or so, there's a lot of criticism. There's a lot of people that have very strong feelings about whether one language versus another language is, is, has merit. And it really doesn't matter. And it's a little bit hard to sort of escape this geek echo chamber that we all live in. But there's a much bigger world out there. And projects like Sahana, for me, make everything I do and what we do worthwhile. Because the idea that software that you write can, um, can essentially change the world and ha help save people's lives is extremely powerful stuff. And what Sahana does is it helps people in disasters. For example, there's a people finder. Hold on, let me get there. So the Christchurch earthquake in Australia, for example, or in New Zealand, um, they use Sahana. And one of the things they used was the people finder. So when the emergency crew find uh, a person somewhere, they ask them their name, and then they register them into the people finder and say, they, they're now over in this church or wherever. This school is where we put this rescued person. And then family members can ask, hey, has anybody located my, my grandmother? Right? Same with relief materials that come in from different countries. You want to match up the materials to where these things are going to be used. This is really important stuff. And writing things that make this possible is a very motivating thing. When you actually see the impact that the things you write has, it becomes worthwhile to keep working on this stuff. And I, there's a nice quote from a government guy in the Philippines. And this is why we do things, right? 
we don't program to program, or at least I don't, and people shouldn't. Programming is a tool. It's a tool that's part of solving problems. And I kind of think we're running out of problems to solve with just pure programming. There are many, many problems out there that need a bit of programming, but they also need a lot of social and sort of people skills to solve these problems at this point. And it's much, much harder to solve some of these problems. And though that's the kind of things that I'm working on now. Programming is a part of it, but it's a small part. It's just a tool to be part of the overall solution. So what I'm trying to get across to, what I have been trying to get across to people is we should try to work on things that matter or matter more than some of the things we've been working on as a, as a geek community in the last 10 years, I think. We've built a lot of things that really don't matter. And I think it'd be nice if we as a community could move a little bit beyond that and try to see beyond our own little geek world and look at what the civilians are having trouble with out there and help them out. Because we have a lot of power we are basically controlling the technology that runs the world these days, but there are so many people that are excluded from that world, and we can help bring them into the fold, and we can help improve their lives with, with technology and with tools and with things, but we need to get to them, and we need to help them out. Anyway, so like I said, I've been doing this for 17 plus years. 1993 on, 19 years maybe now? That's getting kind of sad. Um, so I started all this in 1993 when the web really started to, to hit. I was doing internet things before that. I was playing with Gopher and IRC and things like that. But when the web hit in 1993, things started getting really interesting. So the web looked kind of like this, uppercase HTML, CGI bin, Perl counters, slow and crappy. I needed more dynamic, um, I needed a more dynamic web, essentially, to do the kinds of things I wanted to do. So PHP version one looked kind of like this, kind of like server-side includes, all embedded into HTML comment tags. And you can see a little bit of the hints of the PHP that was to come in this. But it was very difficult working in tags like that. So going beyond that, a PHP version two looked more like this. Right Now we have tags. This is from the SGML standard. This is a PI tag. And the SGML standard looked like this. You didn't actually have to have a question mark, or you, you couldn't have the question mark at the end here. This was before we had the XML standard for, for HTML. This is the kind of PHP that I tend to like. I like very simple, straightforward, procedural PHP. The same code 10 years later. Now it looks more like this. Object-oriented, lots of fancy things in here, exceptions, classes, inheritance, uh, PPP, all these fancy things that just didn't exist in, in 1993. Um, but like I, like to to, I like to tell people that PHP is not a religion. I mean, we're not trying to change the way people solve problems. I built a tool like this to solve problems the way I like to solve problems. But the idea of PHP is to be a tool for anybody to solve problems. And people who prefer to solve problems in an object-oriented way, we, we address that as well, obviously. So why did PHP actually become this popular? You saw my slideshow at the beginning with all those sites using PHP. It's about a third of the web by domain name. So if you type a random domain name, one in three times you'll hit a PHP site. But in terms of actual traffic and clicks, PHP is probably well over 50% of every click on the web. Maybe much higher than that, it's hard to tell. So if you think of every Yahoo click, every Facebook click, every Flickr, various photo sites, but what's hidden in there that I didn't show is that PHP has pretty much 100% market share in the porn industry. So every single porn click is a PHP click as well. And that's a lot of clicks, let me tell you. So why? I mean, why are people using PHP so much? And I think there are a couple of main reasons for it. I think 
PHP was the first complete and freely available ecosystem for solving the web problem. And this wasn't something that just kind of happened. This was actually designed. This was something we thought about a little bit and said, look, we, we need to put all these pieces together. PHP, the language, is just one small part of it. We need decent integration with an operating system. We need integration with a database. And we need to integrate with a web server. And getting all those pieces working together and then documenting it and showing people examples of a complete working ecosystem was key to getting usage and getting market share. How do you solve the problem with C++? How do you solve the web problem with C++? It's not obvious. Right? Even with Java, it's not obvious how you would solve the web problem. Nobody used Ruby until the Rails ecosystem came around, right? I mean, until someone showed you this is how to solve the web problem with Ruby, three people in the world used Ruby, right? So it takes someone to put together an actual solution and to show people this is how you solve this kind of problem with this tool. And PHP was one of the first ones to do that. We also thought quite a bit about what it takes to have ISPs install PHP. Uh, Mod Perl came along a few years after PHP, and they really got this wrong. Mod Perl is way too powerful for an ISP to install in a shared hosting server, because with Mod Perl, you can get into the guts of the web server, you can change everything, and two users next to each other using Mod Perl will step all over each other if they're on the same Apache server instance. So you need dedicated Apache server instances for each user running Mod Perl, and that's just not something that a shared hosting provider who wants to put 5,000 users on the same instance wants to do. So historically, PHP was on every single ISP out there. And if you're writing software that you want lots of people to run, well, you write it in PHP because that's what people have access to. The next part of PHP's success, I think, is scaling. The fact that we scale up due to just simply not having the scaling problem in the sense that PHP is a shared nothing architecture. So there's nothing inherent in PHP that causes your application not to scale. Any scaling issues are things you have added yourself in your whatever data store you chose. Um, but I think scaling up is actually the smaller part of this, of the scaling um, story. Scaling up is something that it's pretty easy, at least to technical people, to us, to, to us geeks. Scaling up is a simple problem in the sense that you benchmark, you profile, you figure out where are the bottlenecks are now scaling, you get rid of locks, you, you, you fix the scaling issues, and it's something you can measure, you can test, and there's a very well-defined set of steps you need to do to fix scaling issues. What's much, much harder is scaling down because that's not necessarily a technical problem all the time. That's sometimes a, a sort of a sociological problem. It's a documentation problem. It's an image. It's a presentation marketing problem sometimes uh, scaling down. And I think doing both is really, really hard. There's very little software out there that is used both by 12-year-old kids playing around on the weekend and some of the biggest companies in the world and they use the exact same version of this software. Think of, I don't know, robotics. Think of um, professional accounting software. Think of all kinds of different types of software that might be used in a very professional sense. And you take the same software and you give it to kids, right? So software that essentially runs Yahoo and Facebook, um, government sites, things like that. And it's also used by my 10-year-old son on the weekends, right? That's really, really hard to do both. And that's something that there's obviously some sticky issues trying to do that because you can't please both ends of that spectrum all the time. There's no way. You have to make some uh, adjustments. You have to make some compromises. Um, and I think that there is where PHP sometimes gets a lot of criticism from the, the higher end of this spectrum where they look at PHP saying, well, it's not consistent. It's not powerful enough. There's only one array type. Um, ignoring SPL stuff, but um, 
that's where we had to make some compromises and say, well, let's just use one array type, for example, because it's a lot easier to show people how to do this. You don't have to think about the internals of arrays. You just say, this is how arrays work. Move on, right? So I think that's a very, very interesting piece of PHP is the scaling down and this very, very shallow learning curve that we have. So new and cool things in 2012. I've been playing a bit with event-driven things. There's two libraries that I really like, LibEvent and ZeroMQ. So here's some code. It's a little complicated looking, but here's some code that basically sets up an event-driven server that sits and answers on a port and just replies back with a got message and message number. And it sits and waits for 10 messages, and then it exits and the client. Whoops. The client looks like this. You connect to the socket, and you send a message, and then you read the reply. So I've been showing this for a few conferences now, trying to encourage people to do something cool with event-driven programming in PHP and with ZeroMQ as well. And I was in Italy two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and a guy came up to me and said, hey, I've done something cool with event-driven stuff like you asked us to. So it's a bit of a joke on Node.js, obviously, but the stuff he came up with is actually pretty cool. Um, so here he has a simple web server, and you can see it doesn't do that much, but it does handle fav icon requests, and it sends back responses here. He also has an example of an even simpler web server that's listening on 10 ports at the same time, so 8,000 through 8,009. And um, since these are event-driven servers, the concurrency is really good. You can send hundreds and hundreds of re concurrent requests at this thing, and it'll handle them nicely. And you can also do non-server type things with this stuff. You can do, for example, here's an example of downloading two files in parallel. You could do this with curl multi directly as well, but this is an example of how to do it um, through event-driven stuff through his React thing that he came up with. So I think this is pretty cool. Have a look at it if you're interested, nodephp.org. Another cool thing I've been playing with is some simple machine learning. And one of the big things about PHP is that we really like to dumb down things. And we've dumbed down, or I haven't, but Ian Barber in the UK has dumbed down SVM um, and machine learning to the point where any idiot can add machine learning to their web application. So SVM st stands for Support Vector Machine, and basically what it is is that you take all these vectors and think of vectors as data points. So if you're trying to predict a future event, um, say spam on your blog site, for example, you have various vectors. You have maybe time of day, you, maybe you have some GOIP information, you might have how old is the blog post that this comment is coming in on, um, you might have email address, whether it's a free like Hotmail, Gmail, or a personal one. So you might come up with maybe 10 different vectors that give you some indication of whether this is a legitimate comment or whether it's a fraudulent comment. And it might be the contents of the blog post or the comment as well, number of links, things like that. And you have all these things, and you also have a history of previous blog comments, and you have all this information, all these vectors for all of those. And you can look at the past events and say, okay, this one was spam, this one was not spam, and then you can teach your machine. You can basically tell it to, to learn, or you basically pass in all those results in SVM train here, and then you've trained your machine. And what happens is that the way SVM works, it takes all these vectors, and we think of just two vectors, an X and a Y. And you say, okay, well, anything that falls above a certain line, we'll call that spam, and anything below th this X, Y line, we'll call that good. But you never just have two vectors. You then take it into three dimensions, and that's kind of what I've tried to show here. Right, so once you're in three dimensions, then the dividing line is no longer just a line, it's now a plane. And here we have a three-dimensional plane that's now the dividing line between those three vectors. And then you take that into n dimensions, right? And then you have this hyperplane that does the 
dividing. And that's what SVM does. It calculates this hyperplane. And then it, you then, for future events, you pass it those 10 vectors. And it comes back and gives you a prediction based on past events whether these 10 vectors indicates blog spam or not blog spam, right? I didn't explain it very well, but all this stuff you can then do in, in two or three lines of PHP, which I find really, really cool. So if you need something like that, have a look at php.net slash svm. You can do some really n nifty things with that, I think. All right. About two, three months ago, we released PHP 5.4, which hopefully most people in here already know. How many people in here are on 5.4 on their production servers? Not very many. All right. Anybody on something older than 5.3? Okay, a few. Well, for those of you, please get at least onto 5.3 soon. It'll hurt less migrating to 5.4 eventually if you're on 5.3. If you're coming from 5.0 or 5.1, it might hurt you a little bit to, to go directly to 5.4. So get onto 5.3 as soon as you can. It's completely stable. It's much faster one, than what you're using so that you're ready for 5.4 in the next couple of months. <coughs> so. In 5.4, there's been a lot of work done on performance. Dimitri in Russia and Zend has done a lot of work on the low-level performance issues in the engine. Um, and lots of other folks as well have been looking at performance. So the result is twofold. Memory handling is much, much better. And we're much more efficient about how memory is used in PHP 5.4. Some um, some applications, people have reported a 50% memory reduction in running large applications. My own testing, I haven't quite gotten that much, um, but it depends on, on what you're doing. And performance-wise, so, so the straight line performance, you can expect between 5 to 15% performance increase going from PHP 5.3 to 5.4. Some of the things that are better and faster, uh, empty hashes, so when you initialize an array, like $A equals array, bracket, bracket, right? That is now faster and takes less memory. The silent operator is quicker now. Unserialized is faster. Um, the way we handle string contents is faster and uses less memory. So lots of cool things on the performance and memory side. We've removed a whole bunch of features. My favorite in here is Y2K compliance. This was something I added in 98, maybe, maybe early 99. People were panicking at the end of the 90s about the whole Y2K problem and how all the computers in the world would blow up on January 1, 2000. And people would always email me asking, is PHP Y2K compliant? And I'd sort of roll my eyes and go, well, what do you mean is PHP Y2K compliant? It's a stupid question. Right? It's what you write in PHP that you need to worry about. It's not PHP itself. But they had a checklist. They needed to check all the software that, that they used, and they had to check off and say, yes, this is Y2K compliant. So that was the big reason, actually, for adding this flag, to give people an action item. It's like, go into your INI file and say Y2K compliance equals true. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So it did do a little thing. It, it changed the set cookie um, to always use four-digit years instead of two-digit years, but that was all it did. Um, so it was basically a placebo. So big new feature in 5.4, traits. So if you know other scripting languages, you might have run into something called mix-ins. Traits are a little bit like mix-ins. The big difference is how we handle conflict resolution between methods that are in, in multiple traits. Um, but essentially, traits are just um, compiler-assisted copy and paste, is how I like to explain it. So imagine having a class with a bunch of methods. And then you have another class with a bunch of methods. And then you have some common methods between these two classes. And it might be implementing something like a singleton pattern, like I show here. Now, one of my big pet peeves that I see out there is that 
people might have a class called base, and everything extends this base class. That's just completely wrong, right? That's not what inheritance in, in OO is supposed to be about, right? You're, classes that aren't related functionally shouldn't be related to each other. I mean, they, you shouldn't have every single class in your system extending a base class. It just makes no sense, right? But people do that because they have some common methods that they want to have in all their classes. Even though one object might be a database object, another one is a user object, they both extend the same base class because they have some common patterns and some common methods that they want. But it's completely broken. It's, it shouldn't be like that, right? And they do that because they don't have a way of doing horizontal code reuse in, in objects. All we have is inheritance so far. And that gives you vertical code reuse. You can sort of vertically, in your object model, you can reuse code, but you can't do it horizontally between two unrelated classes. And that's what traits solves. So with traits, you basically can define a whole bunch of methods and properties, put them inside a trait, like I show here. So trait singleton, you can put a bunch of methods in here. And then once you, when you want a class to use those methods, you just say use that trait. And it's like the compiler copies that block of code into your class. And if you think about that a little bit, you'll, have, you'll hit all kinds of questions about it. But just go back to the fact that it's a copy and paste by the compiler. Just as if in your editor you had pasted this thing in. It behaves the same way. And I can see all these, well, what if? It's like, no, no, it's just like you pasted it. Don't think too much, all right? Um, so there are some conflict resolution things. Unlike mix-ins, if you, say, use trait A, trait B, and both traits implement the same method, just like if you had pasted the same method in twice, you're going to get a compile error on that thing saying, sorry, there's two methods with the same name in this class. You can't do that. So if you look up the documentation at php.net slash trait, it shows you how you can resolve the conflict. So you can say use trait, and then you can alias a method from this trait to be another name, or you can say use this method over that method. So you can control it, and you can, you can then fix that if you're using multiple traits that have conflicts. And that's why they're not quite like mixins, because mixins, the, the last defined mixin always overwrites earlier ones. And that can get a little bit magical when the order does magical things like that. So I much prefer the trait approach, where you have to explicitly say which one you want to use. Another new feature in 5.4 is a short array syntax. You don't need to use array bracket anymore. You can just put square brackets to define arrays. We also have added function array dereferencing. So if a function returns an array, you can dereference it right away on the function call. Right, so here we have a function fruits that returns three fruits. This syntax would just print out apple, right? Because fruits returns an array, element zero is here. Instance method calls. This means that you can instantiate an object and make method calls right away. So here I've instantiated foo. And right on the same line, I can then call set x 20 that sets the x property to 20. And then I can get it back on the same call as well. This is just straight chaining, method chaining. We've had that in earlier versions, obviously. But you can combine that with instance method calls. And then you can start putting some of these features together. So here we have a few things. So we have an instance method call with the short array syntax with function array dereferencing all put together. Oops. Um, and then you can take it even further and you can start doing this. So the constructor as well you can dereference. Um, and this starts to get hard to read, I find. Right? This is one of these things you have to go, wait a second, what, what's that? Right? So here we're passing a nested array to the constructor. We're instantiating foo. And then we are dereferencing a two-dimensional array that's coming back from the constructor. And we get four in this case. Because it's one, zero. We're just trying to pick out this element of it. 
there's really nothing wrong with putting this on a couple of lines of code for the poor guy that needs to read your code next month. <laughs> and that poor guy might be you as well. So <clears throat> be a little bit careful with this. I know it's very sexy sometimes to write these huge, long, nested things, but it does get really hard. And if something in here returns null, then you have an issue, right? Because then you're trying to call a method on a null, and that's going to be a fatal error. So this kind of assumes that nothing goes wrong in this whole chain. Um, so you get rid of all your error checking. <clears throat> Another thing we have fixed, changed, addressed, whatever you want to call it in 5.4, is how we handle this inside closures that are defined inside objects. So here I have a get printer method inside this foo object that's returning a closure. So this is the closure syntax, right? So I return a closure, and all the closure does is uppercase is the first character of this property, right? So the interesting thing here is that if I do something like this, oops, I have an extra semicolon there, um, I instantiate the foo object, then I ask for the closure, and then I call the closure. So one interesting thing here is that I'm now calling essentially a method outside of the class, but I still have access to the private property from that class. So dollar this, because dollar this had access to this property at the time the closure was defined, it still has access. Even though I returned the closure to outside the object scope, I still have access to that property. You can also rebind these closures. So I can instantiate my foo object with bar. I can have another instance of foo, pickle in this case. I can ask for the closure from the first instance that will output bar like before, but then I can bind, I can rebind the closure and say, hey, closure, you should now um, apply to this other instance of this same object, and now when I call my closure again, I get back pickle. In most cases, I wouldn't suggest that you use this in your code, but at the framework level, and there are some really cool things you can do at, at low-level frameworks with this kind of feature. Instead of having to um, refetch a, a different closure, having just one closure that you can then rebind is pretty powerful. <clears throat> you can also disable that, or you can disable access to dollar this, just like you can have static method calls that don't have access to dollar this. You can also have static closures. So you can define your closure as being a static closure, and if it tries to access dollar this, you're going to get a fatal error saying using this in a non-object context, right? We've added a callable type hint. So callable is for anything that you want to try to call. So if you're passing in something like a closure and you try to call that closure, you can type hint it to be callable. Because something that's callable, it's just not interchangeable. There's nothing in PHP's type juggling that can make something callable if it isn't. If you pass in a MySQL resource, for example, an open file pointer or, or just a string, and you try to call it as a function, then it's just not going to work. There's no amount of type juggling that can, that can save you there. And generally, that's what we do with type hinting in PHP. Anything that can't be juggled to be correct, we have type hints for. That's why we don't have type hints for scalars, because if you pass in a string containing one, two, three into a function that takes a number, we can juggle that to be a number, and we can do what you, what you need to do. So type hinting that to, to integer would just be a real pain in the ass for the caller because everything you get from databases, everything that comes across your browser, everything is a string. There is no types coming out of these things, so generally strings get passed everywhere. So PHP's type juggling really helps to make things easy um, on the developer in that case. But for things we can't type juggle, like I said, 
we have type hints. We've also added a web server. So there's a built-in web server. You can do PHP minus capital S, and you can tell it to listen on localhost 8000. And it will now sit, and the document root for this web server will be the current directory. So you can fire up at PHP <coughs> with this web server in a directory full of PHP files, and then just start hitting it with your browser. Really, really cool for testing, benchmarking, debugging, um, IDEs as well can make use of it. You can, of course, change the document root to a different directory if you need to. And even cooler is that you can pass in a router script and you can wrap pretty much any of the big frameworks and any of the big applications out there, Drupal and WordPress and others, tend to have routers. And with a very simple little router script, you can wrap that Drupal router and you can fire up Drupal from the command line and hit it with your browser right away without having to configure a web server. And that, that's really, really useful for debugging. I use it almost daily for debugging APC, for example, because APC you can't really debug directly from the command line because the first request to a file compiles the opcodes and caches in shared memory, and it's not until the second request that I'm using the shared memory. So from the command line, it doesn't help me. I always have to debug through a web server, and that gets really annoying to, to have to go through a web server to debug things. Just having it all in PHP like this is really cool. We've also added a session object. This is just a shortcut. Um, session set save handler historically takes six functions. You have to pass in the names of the six functions to handle your sessions. Now you can define and now you can implement this interface, the session handler interface, and just define those six methods in the class and then pass an instance of that class to session set save handler. This cleans up your code a bit. We've also added binary notation. Just like hex, right? Zero X, you now can do zero B. Slightly improved error messages. We have the actual contents of the unexpected token. Before, we would just say you got an unexpected T string token here. Now we give you the contents of the token. Slightly more useful. And we've added an array to string notice. Everyone in here who's done any PHP has probably written a script that would suddenly spit out array, right? When you try to echo out an array, and that's never what you want. If you see array in your output, you have a mistake, right? So we now have a notice attached to this. Now, I thought this would be a very uncontroversial thing. It's like, obviously, it's a mistake when you see this, but it turns out that it actually affects a bunch of things. So things like array intersect. Array intersect gets the intersection between two arrays. So in this case, element three. So it gives you back the element in the first array that also appears in the second. So here it says element index two, which has three, is the one that appears in, in B as well. And that's fine. So that's the output of this little script. But if you have nested arrays, things start to go wrong because array intersect is only single level. It just checks one level. It doesn't actually nest or it doesn't recurse. So here, if we do it, we start getting these notices. We actually get the right output. After lots and lots of notices, we get the right output. It says array element two appears in both. And we got a lot of bug reports and a lot of complaints from people saying, this function's working fine, but suddenly it starts throwing lots of notices. And it's fine. It, it shouldn't throw a notice. It's giving me the right result. But this is pure luck that you got the right result here. And I can illustrate that by doing this. So here I made it 3 and 999. And we get the same result. It's like array element 2 that contains 3 appears in both arrays. No, it doesn't. Right? We had 3 and 999. This 3 doesn't appear at all in B. The thing that happened was that this got converted to an array, this got converted to an array, and the word array equals a word array, so the string array appears in both, right? This wasn't what you meant to do, most likely. And you can take it even further, and you can say, okay, well, I'll put three here inside an S to the array, and I'll put the string array in $B, and if we scroll down to the output, we'll see, hey, we get the same result. 
with a whole bunch of notices. So the notices here is telling you this function isn't actually doing what you think it's doing. It is not a recursive function. <clears throat> if you need to recurse, you need to use something else. Now, people have complained that these functions should be recursive, which I don't disagree with, but they're very clearly documented to not be recursive currently. Um, it would be a good thing to eventually make them recursive. Some new stuff in JSON. We have a new interface called JSON Serializable. If you implement that, then you, you add a method called JSON Serialize. This is what's going to get called if someone tries to JSON encode your object. So it gives you a bit of control there. We have a JSON pretty printer as well. If you add JSON pretty print, it tries to format the output nicely. And a couple of other options as well. Hold on. Quick time check. 10.02. Okay. Some miscellaneous features. There's a new output API. This only really affects you if you're writing extensions that do any sort of direct output. Very, very few extensions are actually affected by this. Most extensions just return things. Very few of them spit things out directly to the user. Um, we found that people weren't setting their session entropy. We've always, for years and years and years, had a session entropy setting in your INI file that you could set to your source of entropy. But by default, we would try to just build entropy internally with pseudo-random generators which isn't good enough for session entropy. Um, and we have a lot of security bugs filed against PHP because of this lack of entropy. And it was a configuration error on the user's part, but we also didn't really help them out. So now we're forcing <coughs> dev u random by default to add session entropy to a default PHP setup. We've also made short, the short echo syntax um, always available. So even if short tags are turned off, you can use this short echo syntax in your templates. This one has been a bit problematic as well. I switched the default encoding from ISO 8859-1 to UTF-8. And this applies to HTML special chars, HTML entities. And this has caused quite a few problems for people. You can set it back, set default char set to 8859-1 in your PHP INI file but you really should start using UTF-8 because the world is a Unicode world and, and everything is moving in that direction. So you should try to get off of non-UTF-8 uh, systems. Now the problems it's caused is that in 8859-1, basically every character is valid. There's, there's no invalid 8859-1 character. Any 0 to 255, all the ASCII codes are defined to be something. In UTF-8, that's not the same. There's lots of sequences of bytes that are simply not valid UTF-8 characters. And if HTML special char sees an invalid UTF-8 character, it returns an empty string, saying something invalid in here. Can't, I can't convert this. I can't escape it because I don't understand these characters. You get an empty string back. Now, this is usually due to the fact that you're passing it some other character set. You're passing it, um, say, Windows 1252 or something, and before you were simply trying to parse this with 8859-1, and it said everything's fine. But it may not have escaped the right characters because it didn't understand the character set. So there's a bit of an issue here that people start complaining because they're getting nulls back, but it's actually more secure and more correct. You really need to tell it which character set a string is in in order for that escaping to work correctly. And we've had no amount of complaints on this that people don't want to specify their character set in the HTML special chars call, but you really should. Um, so more multibyte work. You can now configure multibyte support at runtime instead of having to recompile the engine. A lot, much better support for Asian characters in these functions. Some open SSL work. Debug backtrace. This one I needed badly. Previous to 5.4, if you call debug backtrace, you get the entire stack back. Um, and you would always need to write your own little function to just say, I just want to see the last three levels of the stack instead of 20. Um, now you can specify the number of stack frames you want. Um, we're now always using MySQL ND 
when you're compiling MySQL extensions inside PHP. You can configure it to use libMySQL client if you want. Um, but MySQL ND is cleaner, faster, uses less memory, um, and you're less likely to run into dependency issues using it. So that's the way forward for PHP. And a few other things in here. My, microsecond precision and request time float. So you have server request time that gives you the, the timestamp, the Unix timestamp of the request, but you also now have it down to microsecond precision. Um, better read line support in the command line PHP, right? It's the PHP minus A. Oops. Um, and some new, there's been a lots of crypt work in the last year, um, fixing issues in Blowfish, and there's some other crypt issues we're dealing with right now. So, what's next? You probably all heard about our PHP 6 troubles. Basically, we tried to move too far too fast with Unicode and PHP. Move beyond what our developers could keep up with and probably made some technology mistakes in, in terms of choosing UTF-16 as the internal encoding because ICU used it. So we had development issues for PHP 6 and we killed it, or I killed it, and we're now trying to take smaller steps. So you saw a bunch of Unicode-related things in 5.4. Hopefully in the next version we'll have more as well. And trying to move in, in, in small steps towards a, a more Unicode-friendly PHP. But it's going to take us a little bit of work. But that's definitely the future direction for us. Other things will follow whatever the current trends are. So what's big on the web in three years? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure we'll have PHP support for whatever is going to be big in three years. Language-wise as well, we kind of trail um, language trends a little bit. We're not really on the forefront of new and cool language trends, but we do get there eventually. And we also need some young blood. We definitely need you guys. We need everybody to help us out a bit. Sometimes it's a little bit frustrating how few people actually contribute to PHP, considering how much PHP is used in the world and how many large companies rely on PHP. It's sometimes a little bit lonely sitting there fixing PHP, fixing PHP bugs for all these companies um, by ourselves. And it's often less than 10 people are doing anything at any one time in, in PHP, which is not a lot of, of people. And you can help us out. It's not very hard to get involved. We have all kinds of resources. So we have our QA site, right? On the QA site, we always have the latest um, release candidates. So we're doing test releases here. We have release candidates 544, uh, release candidate 2. Downloading this, download the tarball, configure, make, make test, submit the test results. It's a very good way of helping us out. So if you have a way to, if you know how to write, configure, make, make test, you can help us out. Not very hard. You can look at, um, if you do have some failing tests, you can look at those tests from other people to see if it's also failing from other people. So you can go into the version that you're testing. Let's look at this one. Okay, it's maybe too, show, too slow to show. Um, but basically, you can go in and you can see for any one of these failing tests. So here's a test that has failed 4,299 times, has failed in nine different ways. So this might be a bad test, right? So this is one thing you can look at. It's like, okay, mine is also failing the same way as one of the other ones. And maybe you can even help us out and, and, and help us fix the test. Unknown error, okay. Anyway, so this is also a good source of where to start. You can go in and help us out with one of these um, failing tests and, and help improve the test. Other things you can do is you can file decent bug reports if you do hit a bug. Don't just yell and scream at us and swear and call us names in the bug report. Actually try to figure out why it's a bug. Um, make sure that 
it is actually a bug. So another thing we need help with is weeding out bad bug reports. So if you go into the bug system, if you look at the stats, we've had nearly 62,000 bugs reported to us so far. It's a little small. So we had 61,878 bugs reported. We have closed 29,000, so we've resolved 29,000. There are still 3,600 open bugs, and there are nearly 21,000 reports that weren't actually bugs at all. And this is a significant time sink for us, that one in three reports are not bugs. It's simply the user not reading the documentation or getting things wrong, not understanding time zones, um, things like that. It's amazing how many people every year discover time zones, right? Well, they think it's a bug that the time jumps from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock uh, on a Sunday night. And then you have to explain to them, hey, you just discovered time zones. Congratulations. And summertime. Um, so we could use some help here. Just scanning for open bugs. And one way to do it is to go to bugs.php.net slash random. That'll show you a random open bug. All right? And you can read through it. And you can see if you can understand what the bug report's all about. This one looks complicated. But there has been some talk on this one. General issues. OK. Don't know about that one. Um, there's also a link up here to the random bug that you can hit. If you didn't understand the first one, you see hit random bug again. If you see OS Windows XP, uh, maybe move on. <laughs> I mean, Windows XP, come on, at least have a modern version of Windows, right? It's, it's a little hard to track down stuff on, on Windows XP. Um, so PBO-related stuff. Um, and anything you can do here to maybe shed some more light on the bug and, and help us resolve the issue is very much appreciated. GCOV. If you want to help us write test cases, GCOV has some very cool resources where you can go in, for example, in 5.4, and you can look at test coverage. And you get some nice charts here where you can go in and say, OK, the, uh, the interbase extension. Well, OK, nobody uses interbase, interbase, but maybe the Intel collator. Here you can go in and see that Collator is numeric, does not have very good test coverage. We only have 33% test coverage. And if you click on it, you basically have the source code highlighted with the reddish thing here being code that hasn't been covered by a test, and the bluish stuff is code that is covered by a test case. So it's a matter of figuring out how do I write a test that triggers S equals null here, for example. So you need to be able to read a little bit of C code but just enough to try to figure out what arguments do I have to pass to this function in order to hit this particular piece of code, and then write a test against that to help improve the test coverage. So it's a little bit more advanced, but it's not that bad. You can also help us document, obviously. If you go to any documentation page, uh, traits, for example, you'll find that there's an edit link right here. If you click on edit, you get taken to this really cool online doc book editor. You can log in anonymously if you want to. And you'll end up on the page that you're at, the traits page. And you'll see the doc book XML. So you need to know a little bit about doc book, but not a lot. Maybe if you're just changing grammar or fixing maybe the French translation, all you really need to do is, is find that text that you want to fix. And then you can submit a bug. Um, and then you fix what you need to fix in here, and then you submit uh, basically a patch through this tool, and the documentation team can then apply it directly. Um, it's a really nice tool to help us do that. And lastly, we have a wiki. So the wiki, you can go if you want to uh, suggest new features. You can go to the wiki, and you look through all the RFCs. So here's a bunch of things that people have suggested that we do better benchmarks, native interface, all these things. Um, that would be a good place to, to go for that. So please help us out. We could really use any and all help that you can give us. Like I said, if you're not on 5.3, upgrade. Test your stuff on 5.4. It's very, very useful performance and memory-wise to get on it. 
and please help us contribute. Thank you very much. So, I think I went over by a couple of minutes, but let's take like two or three questions and then we'll move on, all right? None, don't be shy. Mike's not working. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions, ah. peut-être ouais. Hi. Hello. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's working. You basically say that you were moving too fast with P6. Do you think? What do I think the mistake was in PHP 6? Yes. It's, Unicode is a tough, tough problem to solve, um, first of all. So it's one of these very unsexy problems, and it's really hard to get a big group of volunteers to all focus their efforts on a problem that they don't have. Because most people, don't have the Unicode problem. Even when you go to places that you th might think has the Unicode problem, if you go to Asia, go to Japan, go to Korea, they're actually fine. They're used to their own character set. They don't use UTF-8, right? They use shift jizz, they use EUC-JP, right? They, they have their character set, they're happy with it. In Western countries, we have our character set, we're happy with it, right? Nobody has the problem except when you try to build applications that need to span multiple markets. But the individual small developer really doesn't have that problem. So it's really hard to motivate people to change everything, and to, especially to change over to something that's gonna run slower. There's simply no way of making a Unicode version of something as fast as a non-Unicode version, because every string has to now be stored in a much bigger memory segment, right? I mean, there's just no way around it. Um, string offsets, if you need to go to the 10th character of a string, you can no longer just go directly to the address plus 10, right? Because you don't know the size of each character. You have to iterate from the start and look at, is this two bytes, three bytes, four bytes, five bytes? And you have to iterate each step to get there. So it's gonna be slower and it's gonna use more memory. And that's kind of depressing. Right, so we're moving forward to a version of PHP that's gonna be slower and it's gonna use way more memory and it doesn't actually solve a problem that you have. That's a really hard story to, to, to convince people. So we need to make it easier. We need to turn that story around. We need better libraries. We need something better than ICU. We need a native UTF-8 Unicode library that's really, really, really fast and gets rid of some of those. So. I don't think we made a real mistake. Nobody has solved this really well. We just went too early, I think. We, the library's ICU isn't, isn't what we need for this. Um, and the library support that we need isn't out there yet. And I think that was the mistake. Yeah. But why did you think uh, it, it had to be in the core of the uh, PHP? Uh, we use a MB string extension and it's working fine for a user content string. Right. And when we want to, to parse a specific user string, we know we have to take care of UTF-8. Yeah, I, I know. So, so the argument is, well, it shouldn't be in core at all. Let's just have it sort of as an add-on. And, and most scripting languages have it like that. Most scripting languages have this weird case, like in Python, you put a U if it's a Unicode string, right? I mean. But it shouldn't be like that, right? A string should be a string. A string, a string should carry an encoding, and it should just work, right? So I hope in 20 years we're not still making this distinction between a Unicode string and a non-Unicode string, right? In, in an ideal world, every string should carry its encoding and its length, right? And it should just work. You pass a string to a function, and you say, I now want to get a substring of the middle three characters, and it should just work. You shouldn't have to call MB substring 
and you should worry about which encoding is this thing in, it should just work, right? So that's why I think it should be. I, I know from sort of a computer science and from a performance perspective, of course it's more efficient to divide up the language, to have sort of the single byte and the multi byte and separate them, but eventually, I mean, that, that can't be where we're at in 20 years, right? We're going to have enough CPU and enough memory that we don't have to worry about whether a string is stored in 8 bytes or in 16 bytes, right? So, but the question is, when do we start moving to this future? Everyone knows that the future is Unicode. It's just not clear how we get there. Others? Okay. Speak loudly. So the annotations question. So my issue I have with annotations is adding another language essentially onto PHP and inside PHP. I would like to see a much simpler implementation than, than what I've seen so far. And there's sort of there's a, this trade-off between complexity and, and usefulness. So we have ways of doing annotation with doc blocks and things currently that don't solve the problem that well, but it does, for the most part, solve the problem. It's not great, but it, it, it works. It gets you there, right? Then you have this hugely complex, big, big addition to PHP that does a better job of solving the problem. It's one of these hard things. It's like, damn it, it, we can already solve the problem. It's just not great. And then we add this really, really complicated thing to, to solve the problem better. I would like to see a smaller step there. I, I just think the, the implementations I've seen so far have been way too complicated, and I worry about ongoing support of this stuff because we've had many folks sort of do drive-by uh, contributions to PHP where they drive by, they throw some code at us, and they leave, and then we're stuck with that code for the next 15 years. And if it's simple code, no problem. But the more complex the code is, then we start to worry a little bit, going, hmm, we're going to need to support this in 10 years still. And if the original authors aren't around, eh, then we worry about it. So that, that's, that's my reservation about annotations. Are we done? All right. I'm supposed to hand out a book to someone. Um, let's give it to the Unicode question. <coughs> Which book? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> let's give him a big book. Okay. There you go. Advanced PHP 5 to the first Unicode question up there. There you go. Okay, I am out of time. Thank you very much. I'll be around for the rest of the day. Um, so feel free to come up and ask me questions in private if you want. Thanks. <laughs>